um, let me begin. Uh, so good evening to everyone who have joined today for our second Data Plus Women Singapore Meetup for this year and our very first virtual meetup as well. So do note that this session is recorded. Uh, so myself, Mira Umasankar, I am one of the co-leaders of Data Plus Women in Singapore. So getting to know Data Plus Women, to many of you uh, who don't know what this community is all about, so let me just brief you. I was totally inspired by the other meetup groups in the community around the world. I saw the impact it made on the women in the data space. And uh, the main intention of this meetup is to encourage more women to come forward and share their data knowledge and experience to a wider audience. We also want them to voice out their opinions and share the challenges they face into their day-to-day -day lives. It's not just for women, of course. We also highly encourage men to join us too. So it was at the end of 2018, we started this community in Singapore. We've had five events since then with various areas of focus. So our very first one was a panel discussion with Sarah Burnett and Hu Xiang. The discussion covered topics around the challenges that women face in the data world. It was a fun and interactive session. We also collaborated with WIS for Social Good and we did a hackathon and the data set was about girls plus data. At the end of each event, we got feedback from the attendees to understand their areas of interest. So if you see, we had an event related to the theme data visualization. We cover data visualization best practices to follow along. Uh, we also included a fun challenge. We also had a special guest from the US, Corey Jones, who is one of the INVIS Tableau finalists. One of the other requests from the attendees was to have more hands-on sessions. So uh, we, for, for the first event in Jan was this year was on data prep. So Tanu Shri, who is one of the co-leaders again, who um, is also the most talented product consultants from Tableau, hosted this challenge. So as you see, we are uh, three leaders in Singapore. Hansini, who works as an associate director at Standard Chartered Bank, and Tanu, who is a Tableau product consultant, and uh, myself, uh, I am an uh, AVP at City. So you can scan the barcode here to join our uh, LinkedIn group as well. So these are the events that we have planned for the year. So as I mentioned earlier in Jan, we had a data prep challenge. And today we have a, a very special guest speaker from the Tableau community. Um, in June, so this is a quarterly event. So in June, we will be uh, you know, planning presentations uh, done by student ambassadors. And in September, we're trying to host a hackathon again. And on December, of course, we will just have a closing session with a, with a fun quiz. So getting to know our special guest, it's Heidi, who has come all the way from Germany I'm so glad that Heidi uh, reached out to me as uh, she was visiting Singapore. Uh, so I hope you're enjoying your stay so far here, Heidi. So just a little bit of a background about her. So when uh, she first got in touch with Tableau, she went through the same denial phase as most users. This isn't at all like Excel, <laughs> but soon learned to love the tool. Wanting to bring that love to others as well, she became a business intelligence consultant with the Information Lab Germany, where she turned her passion into profession. She started over 400 new and experienced Tableau users in the past two years alone, holds um, university guest lectures, and is one of the founders and co-organizers of Data Plus Women community in Germany. The only thing she loves more than Tableau are alpacas. And if you hand her an 
Yukelil. She will serenade you. Yes, that is a promise. So now I will hand it over to Heidi to give us some interesting talk about pie charts and some tableau tips and tricks as well. All right. Thank you, Mira. And I guess we'll switch around. Give me just a second to share my screen. And maybe I should start sharing before actually switching the program. Sorry, guys. And here we go. You should be able to see that, right? Yeah, looking good. Okay. So pies. Everybody knows those business users who will always use pie charts. And so let's have a quick talk about why they might not feel be ideal. Pi, the mathematical number, has an infinite number of ever-changing decimal places. It is said that at some point, the decimal places of pi, when converted to ASCII characters, will tell you your whole life story, the secrets of Area 51, and maybe even the next winner to Tableau Iron Biz. But does that make pi the answer to life, the universe, and everything? No, because that's 42. And 42, other than pi, isn't irrational at all. So why would you be? Why would you seek to answer a question with something as irrational as pi? Or pi charts, for that matter? Maybe we should have a talk about that. Maybe we should talk about what it means to be rational why pie charts might not be your answer. When teaching how to create pie charts in my fundamentals workshop, I always tell my participants that pies are very bad practice. And I receive varying levels of outrage at that. But people want to see them, they say, that they're so easy to read, but I love them. And it's true that pie charts do have certain strengths. They display a pole to hole relationship in a very obvious way. They are not called pie chart or, if you're in France, come on bear chart for nothing. But they do have some weaknesses. The magnitudes are not very easy to judge unless they are close to 25, 50 or 75 percent. And even those are only easy to read when they start at 0, 90, 180 or 270 degrees, which you can't see very easily here and which might be even difficult this way. They also don't show anything that can't be as easily shown in a bar chart. Let's take an example. So here we have a pie with six slices and it's currently sorted alphabetically. Company C, the red uh, slice, is 25%. That's very easy to see. But it's better practice to sort the slices descendingly. But now it's not as easy to see how large the slices are. Even the 25% of C is difficult to see. Of course, we can label them, but then we still have to compare with the color legend to find out which slice belongs to which company. Then we could also label the company, but now the pie itself is almost completely redundant because we just read the labels in a circular form. We might as well just use a table if that's all we're doing. But then we could also use a bar chart where it's much easier to compare the shares because the human eye can perceive length a lot better than angle or area. And the labels are easy to read. The axis shows the percentage, so it's easy to think of a part to whole relationship between the bars. And there we go. William S. Cleveland says, when a, vi a visualization fails, if the decoding fails. So the human eye decodes information or um, decodes a visual display, a chart into information. And it's true that pie chart does not equal pie chart. I would love to tell you not to ever use pie charts again, but I'm not going to do that because I know that many people out there love pie charts and they might not use any other chart type. So I want to at least help you avoid the very worst mistakes. So let's take a look into worst practice. Let's go with the first one. 
this was one of the very first client projects I ever worked. And of course, the numbers are all um, completely randomized, but it does show a pie. And I mean, there's a couple of things we note at once. That it's far too colorful, it has too many slices, and how is this even sorted? So we take a look at the legend, and it seems as though it's sorted alphabetically. But why is the dark blue slice at the very end, if it's actually at the top of the legend? Let's show the labels. And we can see here that we have some negative numbers. My colleague Helmut said at the time, and I will never forget that, if you take a slice out of this pie, it gets bigger. And while that may be an absolute dream pie, that's all it is, a dream. This does not depict reality. It completely distorts the picture, and it does not show a part to hold use case. So instead, what we did was, yeah, so negative figures, that's the absolute worst thing you can do. What we did instead, we used a bar chart. And the client was quite happy about that. Let's take a look at another example. This one makes it look as though 36% of women develop breast cancer. Is that the case? Let's take a look at the labels. And this is actually not true. I've seen this one called the Gestalt pie chart because the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This does not display a parts to whole relationship in this one. Each slice in itself is part of all women, but there's no relationship between the slices. So instead what I did was of course use a bar chart and also used another bar chart to show how many women you have to put into a room in order to have one of them statistically have this type of, breast, uh, this type of cancer. And a third use case. You all might know this young lady here. If you don't, then you might at least know this chart. This diagram of the causes of mortality was created by Florence Nightingale. And it's one of the most famous charts out there. Not because it was the first chart ever used to visualize numbers, but because it was the first that it was used to make a point and press for change. Many see this as a pie chart, but it's actually not. And that's why I call it the Florence Nightingale faux pie. It's actually a circular timeline starting on the right-hand side in the middle left. But for timelines, as the name says, line charts might actually be better. This shows the development far better, and we don't have the gap between the two years as we had with the two Nightingale faux pies and it's easier to see the trend very clearly. Now, I've showed you my top three worst practices. Now let's go into better practice. When comparing two pies, it might be a bit difficult. Let's take a look at these. It shows how students feel about science. They were surveyed before, their first, before and after their first science class. We can see at the glance that the colors are not super intuitive because bored and excited have a similar color, even though they are at absolute opposite ends of the sentiment scale. We see very early that many students got more excited afterwards and many don't just feel okay anymore. But did this green kind of interested slice change at all in size? Let's show the numbers. And yes, it did. But the development is very difficult to see even when we are showing the numbers. So what could we use instead? We might use a bar chart, and I guess you thought I would say that, where it's easier to see the combined amount of rather positive and rather negative replies, but it's still not easy to compare the slices in the middle. So, and the colors are still not intuitive. So instead we might use a slope chart. This shows the development of individual replies. We change the colors to make it a bit more intuitive, and we can see that students are overall just better informed than they were before. Another use case, comparing multiple pies. What do you do when you have a question where you want to show the parts of multiple holes? Let's take a look at the maiden voyage of the Titanic. The main question, of course, is who survived and who died in the disaster that was the Titanic's maiden voyage. And that's easy to answer in just one chart. 
but maybe the answer is more multifaceted than that. Maybe we want to check if wealth could buy you a seat on the lifeboat, or if it's true that it's usually women and children first. So we want to break up the passengers by gender and class. We could use multiple pies, and we can see at a glance that men in general were less likely to survive than women. But does this paint the whole picture? What about the number of people per gender and class? So let's put the number of passengers on size. And now it's a different picture. We can see that most female crew members may have survived, but there were very few female crew to start with. The largest group by far was male crew, of whom more than three quarters died. But multiple pies, especially when they have different sizes, are not easy to compare. We could, of course, use stacked bars, but then we're losing the size element again. What if we could have the easy readability of a stacked bar chart with an additional measure on size? Well, we can have that, and that's what we call a Mary Meckel chart. This is my personal favorite chart type, so if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. I love talking about Mary Meckels. This is not the easiest chart to start users on, and it takes a while to read into, but it beautifully shows the two-way part to whole relationship. Vertically, on the y-axis, we see the percentage of people who died within a group, and horizontally, on the x-axis, we see the percentage of that group out of all the passengers. And while this is no standard chart, it still retains the simplicity of the bar chart. Anyway, third better practice, comparing slices with huge size differences. Imagine you want to compare different departments of a company, for example. We can use any KPI, like the number of employees, number of sick days, required data storage, anything really. Some departments are your usual supporting departments that keep the company running, like IT, controlling, sales, you name it. But one or two departments are crucial to your industry and product. So they will be far, far bigger than the other departments, like the big dark blue slice we have here. And the pie chart might look like this. One department making up more than half of the pie and some other departments landing below one percentage point. This is not ideal to show in a pie chart we could use, for example, a tree map instead. This shows rectangles instead of pie slices of varying size. This is ideal to gauge a hierarchy between the different items, or in this case, departments. We can see at a glance by how much your top n elements are the biggest, and it gives you an idea about the weight your items carry. In this case, however, we even have data for several months. So, we could use a line chart, but it would not show the changes in the smaller departments very well, because the biggest, biggest department will stretch the axis too much. But we can use a bump chart instead. This shows the ranks of the departments, and it's easy to see where smaller departments switch rank with each other per month. We could also, well, the absolute numbers are of lesser relevance in this case, but we could add those to the tooltip for additional information together with the percentage. But now that we've talked about worst practice and better practice, let's talk about best practice. First of all, please evaluate. Again, I would love to say don't use pies ever again, but there are reasons where, there are cases where you will have a reason to use pies. Let's say your boss definitely wants it in an ad hoc report and it's just not worth fighting over or your users absolutely insist they won't look at your report if it doesn't contain a pie chart, or you want to ease consumers into a new report when they've ever only ever used Excel and you want to give them something familiar. But first, stop to evaluate if your use case is one that can be answered in a pie chart. Maybe it compares different points in time, it shows a development, so use a line chart or bump chart. Does it contain negative numbers? Use a bar chart, and so on. Next up, minimize. When everything is important, nothing truly is. So don't drown your consumers in visual impulses. Use colors sparingly. Group slices where possible. Usually only one slice is truly important. So let's say it's your company against the competition. So highlight the important one using color, 
and show the others in grayscale as I did here. Next up, maximize. This may be a little counterintuitive given that I just told you to reduce impulses, but this is actually a part of reducing. I told you that the eye doesn't gauge angles very well. It's better at comparing lengths. So maximize the use of the real estate given to you. The center of the pie is only color without information. So optimize your ink to data ratio and make your pie a donut. The huge benefit of a donut is that the eye thinks it's a curved stacked bar. We are better able to compare the different slices. It's not ideal, but it's better. So you can also show the total in, cent in the center, giving more information and saving the space that you would use before for the heading. Or you can put the question into the center, which the donut is answering. Now, if you're thinking there's plenty of dessert charts, so we have pies, we have donuts, there's also waffle charts, which we're not going to go into detail. They are also not exactly best practice, but there's also lollipop charts. And these are a perfect choice if, if you want a more creative bar chart. The strength here is that it emphasizes the end of a bar. And this is especially helpful when you have smaller bars that would otherwise go unnoticed. So plenty of dessert charts to choose from. Next up, obviate. I just implored you to optimize your data to ink ratio just a second ago, and now I'm telling you to show the same information twice. Your consumers may insist on a pie chart now, and their data literacy level may be so low that pies are a valid option, but teach them by putting the same information twice in one chart. So let's say you use a donut chart and put a lollipop chart next to it. So you slowly loosen their death grip on the pie chart and you get them used to bar charts, line charts, slope and bump charts, even very macro charts if you're me. Make the pie chart redundant until you can get fully rid of it. But least of, last of all, there is no silver bullet for every question. I cannot give you the answer for all dashboard design questions. I can simply implore you to be rational and think about why pie charts might not be your answer. Do we get any questions so far? Probably not, right? Anything? No. Great, everybody's still with me. That's perfect. Okay, um, feel free to reach out later on at any time, even just to chat about anything, especially Mary Meckles, you will get me there, or I'll pack it. But until then, let's delve into a bit of quick tipping. So I don't know if any of you have ever attended a quick tipping session before, maybe at one of the TCs or at the Tableau French Festival, but I will be trying to show you 20 tips in 20 minutes and I'll do my best. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask afterwards. Please do yourself a favor and don't try to take any notes because you might miss three tips if you just write down one. All right, here we go. So. Tip number one, formatting. We can use UTF-8 uh, signs in formatting. So let's say I want to show how the text has changed, but I don't simply want the minus sign, I also want a plus sign if they went higher. And I can do that by going into, into this sheet and just formatting my hours. Sorry, it's all in German. I hope you'll manage. Um, and I can just have my numbers here. So I go to this one. I can put a plus in the front and a minus in the back. But I don't only want this. I also want, just give me a second. You see, this is, it's all live. Yeah, I want to have a plus in the front and I want to have a minus in the back, but I don't only want this. So I open up a page of UTF-8 UTF signs, and I can take any kind of sign that I have in here. So maybe something went up, and I can copy this one. And I will put this in the front here, 
or maybe something went down, then I'll just copy this little arrow going down. And now I have perfect little signs in here. And depending on which I choose, they either go down or they go up. So that's tip number one. Tip number two, you can also have one. So what we currently have, if it doesn't change at all, it still shows the plus and we don't want that. So we can change that as well. I can just put another semicolon in here and say no change. And depending on what I have now, I have plus, I have no change and I have the minus. So if you wanted just to have two scales, you can do that as well. So I could put any text of here. I could say this one is higher and then this one is lower. And then this last one has no change, depending on what I do. So now lower, no change, higher. A colleague recently asked me if you can do a kind of bubble chart, but with symbols instead of just bubbles. And you can't, unless you again use UTF-8 signs. So what I did in here was I just duplicated my sheet, uh, not my sheet, my field, the segments, and I put in some UTF-8 signs in here. And if I put this one on text instead of the original one, I can have a shape chart so like a like a bump chart uh, sorry like a bubble chart but with symbols labeling next one so let's say i want to label my bars and i can do that by just hitting the t but i don't want to label the first end i don't want to label the end here i want to label inside but by the end of the bar chart so i have two ways of doing that i can either use a duplicate chart and make this a gun chart and then label these on the, sorry, on the left-hand side. And then just make this a double axis, synchronize them and get rid of the others. So now I've labeled them inside, number, where's number one. But often you don't want to use a duplicate axis or you already have a double axis. So this will not be an option for you. What you can use instead, is you can add a reference line and just label this not with the calculation but with the value don't use a line don't want to recalculate i want this to be per cell and now i can just form it and i want this to be again on the left hand side and now i can even label underneath my bar if i wanted to if i don't then we'll just put this in the middle and there we go. Next up, many of you might be fans of the pages feature. So if I hit play here, I can see how the tourism outbound and inbound changed over the different um, regions. And I want to be able to print this. If I just uh, print this as PDF, this will now give me just the one page and I don't want that. So what I can do instead is I can go to page layout and again it's German so I hope you'll bear with me. This says um, that I can show just the current site that's what it's currently set to but I can also choose show all pages so at the very bottom the pages container that's what we can change and if I do that it will print six different pages so one page in the PDF per page of my pages feature. If I am still working on my fields, so I'm currently looking at the time to fund, and if I'm still working on them, I might have some old calculations that I'm not using anymore, but that are still in there because I'm not certain which one I want to do. So it's very fast to comment this one out, but if I don't want this to be commented anymore, it takes a while, unless you hit your Alt key, then you can just highlight things underneath each other. And if we hit OK now, we can see that the numbers change very fast. The same goes for ad hoc calculations. So everybody knows probably that when you create a donut chart in Tableau, it currently takes some, um, some double axis. 
And it's a bit confusing now if I want to change them, I always have to think about, okay, is this my donut or is it my hole? So what I can do is I double click in here, go to the very first position and uh, comment this and add in using Alt and Enter. Not this way, let's try again. Shift and Enter, yeah, that's the one. I can add in a comment and now we can see it changed on the marks card and it changed on the axis and I can do the same with the other one, double slash, this is my donut hole and there we go. And the fun part and the next tip is if I persist this, so if I just drag it over to the left hand side, that's actually going to give this the name. And that's basically what, um, what Lindsay Poulter did at the RMVS finale, which was pretty amazing. Next one, we can use zoom, we can zoom using a parameter. So what I did was I created a parameter. And you can see that this is just this just tells the question, okay, do you want to zoom this axis or no? And it's a simple Boolean field. And I'm showing this at the right hand side. And what I did was I created a field. And this says if I want to zoom the axis, then I don't want any values. But if I don't want to zoom, I want to have the zero. And then I add it in. Apparently, it doesn't change at all. Not working, apparently. But if I put this zero line on detail and add in a reference line, I could say I want to have my zero line here. I don't want to label. I don't want any kind of filter. I don't even want a line. And it doesn't have to recalculate. And let's do this for the whole table. So now I have an invisible reference line somewhere down here. And if I just don't show my zero, then it does zoom for the moment. If I don't zoom, then my invisible reference line shows up somewhere. So that's an easy way of being able to zoom using a parameter. In here, I I'm just showing the population per country out of 2010. And I've put the region on color. And in the tooltips, I can see, okay, just the numbers. But I actually want these tooltips to also be color filled. And that's a bit difficult. So I have two ways of doing that. I just added another sheet. And I can say I don't want to see the header here. And I can use this in my Viz and tooltip. So just break out everything. And you show your to number 10, uh, 11 in this case, and we can see the numbers change. Change color depending on which region I'm looking at. But I can also make this a bar chart. Let's take the minimum of one. I do want to edit this, make this the absolute maximum, and also make these a lot bigger make them a bit less shaded, don't want to see my axis. And let's actually make this a bit bigger. And you can see the numbers turn up here. So if I go here now, you can perfectly see the tooltips are now shaded. If I want to give this simple bar chart a color, and I don't have it here, and I go to more colors, I instantly get this uh, color picker but maybe I want to use one of the colors I have in my custom color palettes. So what I can do, I can double click, just add in any kind of calculation that I want in here, just to give the same color to every field. Put this on color, and then just pick a specific color from one of my charts, and maybe I want to make this pink. And there you can reach your custom color palettes. If I want to color the historical all-time high, maybe, I can use running max because what I want to know is I want to know if the, in this case, sum of my energy usage is the same as the running max of my sum of energy usage. And that one broke. Just let me try again. Put this in here and put this one on color. And then we can see, let's say we want to be usually green and it's really bad if we are not. So we let's give this a dark gray. 
So we can see um, year 2001 was higher than 2000, 2002 was lower than the ones before, but then 2003, again, looking at that period, was the historical all-time high. Every time we reach another all-time high, it will color that accordingly. Sometimes we have a geographical field, which is not recognized by Tableau as a geographical field, for example, region, Tableau treats it as a text field. But we know that region is actually perfectly accumulated by the different countries. So what we can do is we can assign a geographical role and we can create that from country. And now region is a geographical field. It will take a bit to compute that, but give it just a second. There we go. Region is now perfectly able to color this. What we can also do is we can change the color of the background. So currently my water is white. Maybe I want to give this a different color. So I can go to maps and change the card layers, but I only have bright and dark in here and maybe have this fancy one but I actually want to want the background to be colored. So I can go to formatting and change the shading. And let's say I want this to be black, just for the fun of it. Let's make it pink. But it doesn't really change. So you can see only the background changes and the water is still white. So what we do here is we go to maps, map layers, and we don't show the base of the map. And then everything changes. So, and, and now, Whenever I change the, this is a bit confusing. No, 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 sorry, screen there. When I change the shading, I can now give this any color I want and it will always change the whole map here. I can also shade the background of a whole dashboard by using a floating container. So what I did in here, if I click shade me, it will make the whole background white because this is actually just a floating container in the back that I am showing or not showing using a collapsible container. So you can see just a collapsible container that we can show or not. If we want to color the background, we can also use a set action here. So you can see I have a very, I have a color picker, which is just a pie chart incidentally with different colors. <laughs> yeah, girls in the background are laughing, that's fine. Uh, with just different colors. And I have a color sheet, which again is just showing the colors. I used the tree map because it was fast. Um, it's probably cleaner if you use a, a bar chart. But I am now using a set action. So I want to have an action in here, which is going to be a set action. And using my color picker, using a hover action, I want to be able to set the color and I want to keep the values that I have. And let's check this out. If I go here, you can see it gets blue or green and I can actually go around and depending on where I stop, this will stay as it is. If I want my users to now find, figure out how to use this, I can just do a screenshot, paste that into PowerPoint and just put in some stuff overhead. And I don't actually want this picture to be shown. So you can see I put a huge white frame around, which is exactly the same size as my dashboard. And I can save all of this as a picture so that it's transparent. And then I put this transparent object in here again as a collapsible container. So if I click on this now, it's showing what to do. So I have an instructional overlay that I can show or not. I can also use highlight actions to deselect. So the reason why we are using a select action, a sorry, a hover action here is because Tableau will always stick with the one that we currently selected. But we can change that. If we just add in a different field, so it's just an ad hoc calculation, and we can persist this one. So just choose it over. Yeah, this is fine. And we just need that in here. 
And now if we make this set action a select, and we add in an extra highlight action. So because in the color picker and in the color picker only, I want to highlight this deselect me field. And because it's the case for every single slice that we have here, Tableau will highlight all of them. So I can click and it will stay selected, but we can, it will not de-highlight all the others. So we can see what's been selected, but um, the rest doesn't get white. And always in here, yes. And the last two tips, we can use shift and arrow to move floating objects quickly. So you can see this one is currently in the way. Usually we would use just the arrow to shift it, but if we use shift and arrow, we can shift it so much quicker. And an extra tip, tip number 21, I can use floating text fields to comment for my developers. So let's say I have some very important info. Important info here. Let's make this a bit bigger. And let's make this red because it's important. And I don't want this to be floating around in the chart. I don't want my users to see it. So I just shift that to the very edge and beyond my dashboard. And now the user will not be able to see it, but the developer can when they open up the workbook to work some more on it. And that's 21 tips. I don't know how many minutes I needed, but I hope it was under 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. That was really interesting uh, topic on the pie charts. And I'm totally against it. And uh, I'm sure Sarah, who has joined, Sarah Burnett, is uh, aware of that too. Um, and the tips were really good as well. I'm sure we can use that to minimize our uh, time at work as well. So thank you for sharing those tips. OK, so the next part will be on the community. So we all talk about uh, Tableau community. So Tableau community is one of the most vibrant and welcoming technology communities in the world. But why is everybody so enchanted with it? And uh, what's in it for you? So when we speak of Tableau community, uh, they're all on Twitter. You can find thousands of data visualizations or Tableau enthusiasts who are active and contributing to the community every time. When I say contributing, they help each other. When you have a question to ask that's Tableau related or even data vis related, there is always someone helping you out. It has helped me both professionally and personally in many ways, but I'm just gonna focus on the key points. So if you look at this slide here, so these are, there are various community projects like the social uh, data vis projects that's there in the community. So I participated on two of them last year, which is Make Home Monday and Iron Quest. So Make Home Monday is a weekly project. And um, so last year I did all 53 uh, visits and um, Iron Quest, it's kind of like the Iron Viz, uh, uh, Iron, yeah. So if you're not sure about Iron Viz again, so Tableau hosts, uh, every year, there's a Tableau conference, and uh, they do have this iron viz going on, uh, where the three finalists just participate on stage in front of thousands of people, just uh, busying uh, live for 20 minutes. So, so Iron Quest is based on the same uh, theme. So just to get you uh, participate in Iron Viz. And uh, so this is hosted by uh, Sarah Bartlett. So she's the Tableau ambassador and a recent Zen master as well in the community. Um, yeah, so if you see how this has helped me is, so like most of us, when I initially joined the community, I was very intimidated by all the amazing work that others were creating. However, after a few weeks, I learned that the Tableau community was an asset and rather than being intimidated by their work, I used their work as inspiration. 
the truth is we have all been the newbie. We've all had to start somewhere. Being intimidated is not helpful, but being inspired is. It might be difficult to get started, but once you're into it, it's totally worth it. So I can't uh, thank Sarah again, Sarah Bennett enough for getting me started because in 2018, um, she did all the Make Home Monday visits and um, that's how I gained my inspiration from. So what I learned from participating in this project is, um, so professionally there was, there is faster turnaround. Having performed this exercise for a period of time, it, it has helped it, it has had a trickle down effect on all my day-to-day -day work and pursuits. It has helped me work faster and more efficiently, therefore vastly improving my turnaround time on, uh, on both personal and professional projects. And of course, I've gained a lot of inspiration. I've been inspired by many others in the community, whether it be design, analysis, or storytelling. I've not only implemented these improve skills with the project, but I've been able to implement them at work. It's incredible to see variety of visuals, what the community produces using the exact same data set that they give uh, every week for Make Home Monday, for example. And I was able to also identify my own style. So to practice an iteration, I've identified my own visualization style. This has led to more consistency in my professional life as well. And of course, uh, the important point is door to new opportunities. The community outreach has opened doors to many new opportunities, one of which included my new position recently. So because of uh, the amount of practice that I had put in, um, you know, whenever I go for interviews, I was able to um, answer them questions and um, it has helped me to build a very strong Tableau public portfolio as well. And finally, discipline. Uh, I've become much more disciplined through my work with participating in these projects, which is directly contributed to the advancement in my career as well. So if you want to get involved in the community, do reach out to me and um, ask for help anytime, me or it can be anybody in the community, they are all ready to help you. And um, yeah, so now I will pass it over to Heidi to share her experience in the community as well. Thanks, Amira. So when I started in the Tableau community, I didn't even know what I was doing so. So first thing I did was I networked because I was just talking to a friend of mine and complaining about how Tableau is nothing like Excel and it's super unintuitive and you can't even color the labels, like how, what kind of program doesn't do that, uh, which was before I started to love Tableau. And that friend knew somebody who got me my current job, which I love very much. So what I did next was I was invited to an event, which at the time was the uh, Tableau Zen Master Days in Hamburg. And there I met Andy Kriegel and Eva Murray, and that's me in the background there. It allowed me to widen my network. I met my would-be employer, so I started with the Information Lab just a few months later. I met people who are now my clients, my colleagues, my mentors, and that's an amazing thing. So go to, con or continue to go to Data Plus Women. It's the best thing you can do to meet new people who might help you. But maybe you're somebody who doesn't like to get out of the house. So use Twitter. It's not an excuse. If you want to stay in bed, that's fine. You can tweet from there. Uh, that's not what I did in this case, but what happened to me was I uh, reached out. I was reading a perfect uh, blog post by Matt Chambers, who was a Tableau Zen master at the time. I'm not exactly certain if he's still one, probably deserves to be. And I created a tile map for Germany. He had created one for the US using hexes and I used one using trapezes. And he returned, uh, he replied, and that was pretty great. And a day later, I suddenly was turned into Viz of the Day, which was amazing. And then one year later after that, um, Klaus Schulte, who is a returning Tableau Zen master this year, uh, won the RMVs Europe in Berlin, no, in London, sorry, 
in London using this tile map and he even credited me. So that's the amazing things that can happen to you if you just tweet and <laughs> reach out to people online. Uh, please make sure not to tag people who are famous just for hitting it right on their fame. That's not appreciated if you abuse the kindness of others. So be kind and others will be kind to you. And yes, I was also invited to speak together with Klaus at the Berlin Tableau user group. So that's how I started delving into Tableau user groups and also Data Plus Women later on. For me, it's also helped to build a Tableau public portfolio. So it helps me to showcase my skills. It helps me to have a portfolio for, your, for my or your next Tableau related job. It's allowed me to skip a step in the application process for the job I currently have. So that might be helpful if they already know what you can do. And it impresses clients and it validates my skill set. I've also recently started blogging. Uh, in the past, when you would Google Heidi Kalbe, Google would always say, hey, did you mean Heidi Kalbe, who is an old German actress, which none of you knows, um, and who sadly passed away 10 years ago. And you can see that the names are pretty similar. Nowadays, I have enough quality content online that Heidi Kalbe will actually result in me. So, uh, <laughs> especially if you have a common name, you will be the one you want to pop up first in a Google search. You want to be the one on top of Google. And if you maybe have some unflattering content of your past, you want to push that down. So blogging will definitely help you there. Um, people might even repost your content. So I was always thinking nobody will ever read my answers. But then one of them recently turned up in Andy Cotterieff's Best of Tableau Web. So there are people out there, and even if just one or two people read your stuff, it does help. Also, uh, what I have found that when I gush about Mary Mecco charts, people come up and say, okay, but how do you build one? And then I don't want to delve into a five minute explanation or write them a 20 instruction point email. I can just post in a link there. So it saves me plenty of time. I have perfectly formatted answers ready to share. And to be completely honest, I always forget how to do Mary Mecca's, so I also check my own blog posts. Next up, speak. I know public speaking is scary as hell, it always is, but it does feel like flying afterwards. People are always scared of speaking in front of an audience themselves, so the audience will be impressed and somewhat grateful that you were the one to speak in front of everyone. You also become approachable because you are convinced that your opinion is worth being heard. So people will come up and have questions or compliments or just want to stay in touch. It also helps you improve your own soft skills. Public speaking becomes a little less scary with every presentation you do. And it helps you become more confident in every kind of human interaction in general. So this was me 2018 at the Tableaus and Master Days, which I just talked about. And I did a group work with a later client and I allowed him to present our content because I was super uncomfortable speaking in front of the crowd. But then just a year later, I participated in my very first um, Tableau Fringe Festival. And that's what I absolutely recommend to you. Use the Tableau Fringe Festival as a starting point if you're afraid of public speaking, because if you don't know, it's a virtual conference. So you can do it in the safety of your own home, behind your laptop, in your PJs, you don't see the audience, um, and it gives you great coverage. And it allowed me to build a library of content to be pulled at any given moment. So the talk I was holding in this picture, I have since held six or seven times at guest lectures, at info evenings, everywhere. So you have content ready to share when people ask questions, and again, it's increased my SEO. And I later on had a conversation with a client who said, hey, I, I recently watched a video on the topic we're just talking about. And it turns out that he was watching my video. And this, again, talking about public speaking, this was me just last year at TC Europe. So it's even allowed me to get a session there. And that's 
the advancement you will make in just a bit of time if you continue to speak in public. Now, we talked about how you can start, but how do you actually go on? First of all, stay engaged. This is not a sprint, the community is a marathon. Just continue to tweet, to biz, to blog, to speak. Nurture your network. You don't want to be a one-off show, you want to be a consistent contributor and build mass. So you focus long-term. Also, say yes. That is something I have learned. And somebody said to me once, if an opportunity bites you in the behind, you take it first and figure out how to do it later. Just as I did with this Data Plus Women event. <laughs> so be brave and push yourself. There's so much more inside you than you know. Become that person that you want to be by stopping to tell yourself what you cannot do. It also helped me to find my passion. So there's plenty of things you can do and it's natural to try things out. But once you've found what you love, do just that. For me, that's blogging and public speaking. So I have my blog, the Tableau Fringe Festival, if they continue to have me. I have Tableau user groups and I have my own Data Plus Women chapter in Germany. It's also helped me to get a cheerleader. What do I mean by that? It helps to tell somebody your goals just for accountability. I recently said to my personal cheerleader, thank you for continuously pushing me over the edge of the cliff so that I can realize that I can actually fly. I'm not a penguin. <laughs> At my first TFF, this was a few minutes after I applied for my first TFF and my, my personal cheerleader was sitting next to me and a lot of things passed through my head. So what I said first was, oh God, why did you push me to apply? Followed up by, thank you, thank you, thank you for pushing me to apply. Followed by, oh God, what if they don't take me? Followed by, oh no, what if they do take me? And that's okay. Hey, you are going to panic and it's perfectly all right. That's why you have your cheerleader who will hold you accountable to follow your goals. Last of all, help others. People say that karma is a bitch, but she's actually not. Karma is my personal best friend. When you help others, you will be helped in return. And that's what's so powerful about community. You help them, they will help you. And you have plenty of friends all over the world. And last but not least, don't wait, start now. Now is the time to start getting hold of your dreams. So don't just wait for tomorrow, start now. Thank you. Hey, uh, so thank you, Heidi. That was really inspiring. And now uh, we will pass it over to Tanu. Yep. Thanks. Over to you, Tanu. And thanks, Mira. Um, I think we all learned so much from it. Beyond the tableau parts, I actually picked up two quotes from both of you, which I thought was really interesting. So Heidi taught me to, whenever, when everything is important, nothing is. And Mira, being intimidated is not enough. Being inspired is. So if I took nothing away, those two words stick by me. So with that, thank you for everyone who stayed on. Um, we have a quiz and a few games at the end of it. So I think you can see my screen. If I could just get you to go to kahoot.it and enter the game pin that you see up there. So we'll give it a little time and... Just check around for people to come in. Okay, I can see people have joined. So at the end of this, we will need you, for whoever is going to win, we will need you to send across your email addresses so we can get in touch with you so we can get you your prize. So since I won't know who Slim is. My name. Give it some more time. I can see people enter. So Heidi actually helped us compile this quiz. Uh, there's a bit from the session, there's a bit 
from general knowledge, mostly from the session. And it's actually pretty fun. Let's give it a little more time. To play the. That's the amount we can endure. All right, I'm giving you a minute more and we'll start the quiz. Perfect, perfect. I think we'll get started. If there's any last minute people, you have 10 seconds more. I see a question. Sure, so I got a question on how do I get to this link? So you just have to go to the kahoot.it and enter this game pin. Okay, let's get started. So question number one, what is the pie chart sometimes called in front? So you have three options in front of you. On your screen, you could choose the color that you see there. So you choose a red, blue, or yellow. Okay, so I see five people got it right. That's actually correct. So interestingly, a camembert, and that's what Heidi mentioned right in the starting, is a name of cheese from France. And it's circular, hence it looks like the pie. I don't know what a Roquefort is. So Heidi, maybe you could tell us at the end. Good job, good job. Good job, Shaheen, for making it to the top. And... Which of these can the human eye give? I think this one should be a straightforward one. See, 13 people have answered. Get the last one in. Length, that is perfect. Um, so this again was what Heidi had mentioned when she was covering why things like graphs make more sense. Interestingly, things like graphs or bar charts or anything that has a common baseline of reference are easier for us to code because without that, as humans, we don't know what to compare it against. So when it comes to an angle or an area, it's harder for us to gauge what the baseline is. Ooh, I see LJ has come to the top. Congratulations. And we go into the next question. So how many slices should a pie chart have? A pie should just have one. Your own. So I see most people put five or six. So as Heidi had talked about, it's better to have smaller chunks so that people can interpret this better. And as soon as you go beyond five or six, you would probably want to go towards a bar chart because that's when people can compare across so many different categories. Okay, so LJ is on fire. Let's move on. Which of these shows dev rank over time.
Okay, awesome. I think most people did answer bump chart. So, Madam Echo, I would highly recommend you see uh, Heidi's blog post and Heidi's video on this chart. She will go into what, when and how you'd use it, although she did cover it in the session. Bump chart, interestingly, the name came up from a boat race where each boat tries to bump each other to the top. So just a fun fact for why a bump chart and why it's called that. So let's go. Oh, I see LG still on fire and we see the others have moved up a little bit. So let's move on to the next question. The second last question. Says B. So which of these helps display symbols as text? Now this is something that was just a hint raised during Heidi's tips session. Awesome, so most people got it's UTF-8, that is right, and this is an awesome tip, like Heidi had showed, especially when you're looking at building KPI charts. A lot of customers tend to ask for this. And we have our last question. I see the race is tied between SESB and LJ. Let's see who gets it. Let's continue, or if someone who's third or fourth takes it over. What's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? This, although not covered by Heidi, I would say it is more of a wild guess as to what you think it would be. So nine people said 3.14, and I think that's because she covered the pie chart, but lit I think she was trying to stay away from pie. It's 42, and in case you're wondering where that reference is from, actually, if I could post it, if anyone knows where the reference is from, can you post it on the Q&A box before I say it? Otherwise, I will go ahead and say it, where the 42 comes in from. I think this is what Heidi was referring to. One. For the two people who got it. Lucky guess. Oh, that is right, Cheryl. Thank you. It is from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I think, Heidi, I will confirm with you, but it is from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a really fun book. And essentially, he says this is the answer to life. Why? I would encourage you to read the book or just Google why. And with that, our winner is CLI. So you'll have to tell me who you are. LJ at number two. And it seems like SESB made it right to the top. Congratulations. And Shan Swagat, we really, you were right there. So before you do leave and while I'm going through the engagement, I do want you to post your email addresses and just send it to the panelists in your options so that we have it and we can reach out to you to give you the prize. So thanks so much and let me just move over to the next engagement that you can stay on with. Oh, and let me shut this. And just a quick screenshot so we have this recorded. And in the meantime, do send your emails addresses across, otherwise we won't be able to give you your prices. This is for the top three. Okay. So, as we go on, and again, I think there are two people still left to give their email addresses, so let's go ahead and do that. So as we went through, Mira did discuss the community, Heidi did discuss the community and how they sh that shaped a lot of what they're doing. So probably the most immediate next step that we would highly recommend is do create a Tableau public profile. Um, if you are interested in data visualization and you're looking at making a career out of this, both Heidi and Mira are two people who have been able to gain, they're both not from Tableau, but both were able to gain something while being, be able to gain something career-wise while being involved with the community. And you can see that they both have really, really great, really, really great material out there. So you can follow them on Tableau Public. 
I think we're running out of time, otherwise I'd give you some time to create your public profile right now. But I do highly recommend at the end of this and do tweet us or post it on Instagram once you've created it. And for any mentorship or any interest that you want, you can reach out to us directly. So in case you're wondering, okay, I can create a profile, but how do I really get started? So like they said, there's our tweets and blogging and maybe a good way to get kickstart your journey is if you're interested in data visualization, I do recommend these weekly challenges that come up, which is called Makeover Monday. This is essentially where they'll put a clean data set for you. You would make a visualization out of it, upload it, and you will get feedback on what you put. And that's why it's progressive. And that's why you will see a lot of people, including Mira and including Heidi, they start with a visualization as it goes on. They tend to have much better visualizations as the time goes by. Another challenge or another weekly challenge that had started recently that I'm actually pretty uh, passionate about is something called prepping data. So for me, I'm a little more interested in working through data challenges and logic, and you can do that with this blog post and this link, and we will be sending you these slides as a follow-up so you can get it there. But essentially, this will help you. You will get data challenges posted every day, data sets posted every day, and then you could use any cleaning software or anything that you use to find the solution or get the output. And I love this because it activates this kind of brain of mine, which helps me think through all the possibilities and it's pretty fun. And again, um, do stay engaged with us. Uh, we have an Instagram page, it's fairly new. It's a baby Instagram page, which we started earlier this month. So do follow us on Data Plus Women SG. If you'd like to just keep up with our events, then we have a meetup group. Um, it's just called Singapore Data Plus Women. And we have a LinkedIn group plus called Data Plus Women SG as well, which was the QR code that you had seen in the starting. And of course, we are looking for speakers. There are a lot of you in this community, a lot of you joined this chat, who are very talented and are working in the data world. And we would love to have you at any of our events. It doesn't have to be something related to Tableau, anything that you're doing that you would find interesting or you'd like to just discuss with us, reach out to us on this email ID and we will coordinate with you on the next steps. And we would really, really look forward to having you speak with us. And with that, we've come to the end. We really, really wanted to have this in person, but because of what's happening right now, we had to move it virtually. That said, we don't want to lose out on a good photo. So can I please request everyone to Bring their phones out, um, put on some lighting, like I just will in my own house, and take a quick selfie or a computer selfie, that is a patented word, uh, and just put it up on Instagram or LinkedIn or Twitter with the hashtag data plus women SG. We will be compiling this and we'll send it out to everyone who's registered today. So I'm gonna go ahead and do mine, and don't worry if you're in your pajamas, because. That was the point of this. And, and I'm going to keep that open so that you can have that. Before we switch into feedback. So I'll keep that open for another minute or so and then we'll switch in for feedback and you do remember the Q&A poll is open for you to still ask any questions. And with that, Let's go into feedback before I lose you over. So if I could just get some feedback on the event, this is really, really important to us as we design new events. Of course, you can reach out to us via email as well. If you'd like to share some personal feedback, we would welcome it as well. If not, then you can just add it to this um, link. I'll post the link on the chat box right now.
go ahead. Otherwise, you can scan the QR code. And I think we have the email addresses as well of the top three. So thanks for that. While you fill that, I just really, 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 really want to thank Heidi, especially. She has flown all the way from Germany. We were hoping to do a physical event where she would, you all would get to meet her in person. Um, but since we have the virus going on, it had to be moved to virtual. So we really, really appreciate you taking out the time. So thank you, Heidi. And if any of you have questions, feel free to post it. We will still be around for another five minutes or so. Otherwise, I do want to thank everyone on the call as well. We appreciate you taking out the time and coming for our Data Women virtual event. We will keep you posted on the next physical event or virtual event as it may be. And do stay healthy and do stay safe. Thank you.